it's important to remember that you can invest for dividends or you can invest for share price appreciation. And that's a reasonable thing to do. And there's earnings, but there's also narrative. And it's not like value is the only thing that matters. Like I, I am attracted to the traditional value approach of finding undervalued companies that are actually much better than people think. And that's very nice. But at the same time, what we're doing investing is trying to think what other people think about this company and what they're going to think in the future. So if you can incorporate that into a, a non-value based analysis and realize five, 10 years ago that everyone's going to go crazy for electric cars, therefore Tesla or whoever, um, that's reasonable too. And you don't have like your hot dog point is true, but it just shows that there is more to investing than earnings. Welcome to the Exponential Investor Podcast. Want to be a better, smarter, more clued up investor? Well, you've come to the right place. We cover the breakthrough investment ideas you don't hear about in the mainstream to keep you on top of the megatrends and opportunities reshaping our world. Good morning and welcome to another episode of the Exponential Investor Podcast. I am your editor, Sam Volkering, and here with my co-editor, Kit Winder. Now, Kit, it's been a little while since we've done one of these together, I think, uh, I was away, you were away, uh, for one reason or another, it couldn't be done one week. So it's been a little while since you and I have caught up to discuss uh, all things exponential investor and what's been happening in the market. Um, so I want to, I, I, it would be remiss if we didn't go to an area uh, of your specialty, which has been an absolute headline grabber for the last couple of weeks. We haven't had a chance, you and I, to really sort of go through this in any great detail, but I am referring to COP26. Um, we've written about it a bit in Exponential Investor, you know, the, the, the issue around a whole bunch of political leaders getting together in Glasgow, of all places, yeah. uh, <laughs> to talk about, you know, the future of green policy, um, a transition to net zero. It's it's a big deal, whether you like politicians or don't. Personally, I don't. Um, and whether you think they're effective or not, personally, I think they're not. Uh, nonetheless, it is relatively important for the direction of major economies, policies moving forward around around green energy and, and, and all of that. So um, what, what what happened? Give me your thoughts. What is was it, was it a success? Was it a failure? Was it good, bad, ugly, or everything else in between? Yeah, well, to spare people listening to the uh, 297,000th opinion on the sort of good, bad, and nuances of, of COP, um, it's pretty hard to say. Like, there are so many takes, there are so many opinions, and there have been so many articles written about different parts of it that I, if people want, want to sort of know the details, I would suggest sort of just going on a basic news website that'll give you a list of things that happened. But um, the only thing I can sort of bring myself to say about it is maybe something that you'll appreciate really, which is that my 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 number one feeling through the negotiations and through the announcements that were coming out is that this was a COP that was so different to Paris in 2015 because they're no longer the most relevant factor to the energy transition because now we have low cost alternatives driving change at unprecedented speed. The momentum is now built. It's not building anymore. Electric vehicles are taking over. Solar and wind are cheaper than coal in 80% of the world and 85% of countries in the world have net zero commitments. We're basically done now. The ball is rolling. We know which way it's going. And and all that was happening at COP really was sort of, you know, slight di directional changes or changes in the speed of travel. Uh, and those matter, right? It matters that we pledge to cut deforestation or end deforestation by 2030 or cut methane emissions by 2030. And I was pleased to see those things getting the attention that they deserved because there may be, you know, the first level is solar, wind, electric vehicles and batteries, but the second level of of priorities like deforestation and methane emissions are sort of go a bit under the mainstream radar, I guess. And I'm relieved to see that um, these conferences are taking those things seriously. But yeah, basically the energy disruption, as I now like to call it, is well underway and politicians are, but steering the course, they're not, they're no longer required to, it's not like people have this view that, politicians have to do something or that you know they're not doing enough or I don't know but the thing that is happening is that entrepreneurs and business people and engineers are building these incredible solutions and you talk about disruptions like the car or the mobile phone or the personal computer or whatever that changes things more than any politician can ever dream of yeah I agree uh you know private industry tends to push these changes faster 
than any sort of political uh, move really can. They kind of said just sort of just jump on the bandwagon and and try and uh, caress the uh, the narrative. I think towards the fact that maybe they're effective, but I think the real effective change comes from private industry, innovation, development companies that want to, you know, do better things, find better ways to do better things, or um, you know, break through with new technologies. I I, I can't help but think that a lot of these kinds of um, gatherings, if you will, um, are, for sh- um, are really just for show to try and justify them looking like they're doing something. No, I mean, I, I think it's worth just to interject at this point that I, I say what I say, but six years ago, it was a different story. You know, the technologies weren't quite ready. They weren't economically competitive with, with incumbent fossil fuel technologies or appliances. Um and what happened at Paris was remarkable. Never before had 195 countries come together and signed a single document. Never before had there been such a clear um, statement made, be made, around the way that we were going to approach the climate crisis, that all countries were going to take it seriously. It sent such a clear signal to businesses and investors. And and the, the remarkable changes that have happened since then are, are in large part to do with the Paris Agreement and and obviously we haven't fulfilled every pledge from there and there's lots of things that are wrong with it and and all the rest of it. But I think, I I suppose the point I want to make is not that politicians are always irrelevant, but in the energy transition, although they were much more important at the start when you need, you know, public funding for technologies that aren't ready yet, or if you need subsidies for renewables when they're five times more expensive than gas, that's when politicians can do their work because they can sort of overcome non-economically viable hurdles that the private sector can't yet. Um, that's what had changed now, really, is that those hurdles don't exist in many places anymore. That's why there weren't huge pledges around, you know, solar technology and wind technology and electric vehicles. It's because those the ball is rolling and those things are happening. So, yeah, I just want to sort of reiterate, it's not like in general politicians can't do anything. As you know, I don't think that. But certainly that has changed massively in the last six years. And I sort of took took great heart in that, really. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of companies out there that get grants from, from government um, that in many, in some cases, the grants are the, one of their sole forms of revenue. And, and uh, that helps them to push forward and develop these technologies, which they can then look to capital markets as well to draw on through capital raisings. And, and again, continue to push some of these technologies through, which is, you know, th- there are many, there are many cogs to, to the, to the machine, uh, really, uh, and and to say that one is lesser than the other, I mean, you could debate that for forever and a day. I think the interesting, I I, I found um, momentum uh, that that talk about momentum is certainly an interesting thing. It it the, when I hear the talk about green energy or, or, or related technologies and momentum, my mind immediately turned to the um, rise of uh, some of the EV companies again. So you know, Lucid, Lucid has has gone on a bit of a tear, as uh, you know, everybody's looking for the next great something. Um, everyone wants to find the next Tesla. It's um, like everyone wants to find the new hundred billion dollar company, and so they buy stocks yeah. in a company that's already worth a hundred billion, and you're like, wow. Well, so I think was it Lucid passed the market cap of Volkswagen Group? Yeah, big time. Um, quite right too, don't you think? Well, they have delivered, I think they've delivered at least six cars so far. Yeah, and really good ones. Really good ones. Look, I'm not going to look, to be honest with you, if if the Lucid was available and at a reasonable price, I'd be I'd be seriously looking at it. Yeah, it's an awesome car for sure. It is a is a pretty pretty mean uh, mean looking machine. And if it if it, it can achieve the kinds of range that it claims to, uh, which is genuine Tesla smashing range, um, it could it could change the game now. Ha, ha, worth more than the Volkswagen Group, I think my views on this have been pretty well established for a long time. You know, Volkswagen Group makes millions of cars per year across a number of brands. They you know they have complete supply chains. Uh, they are a, a, a entrenched dominant part of the auto industry. So to to come along with a car company that you know has potential to be a very large and important you know, car maker for the future. Um, but to, to push the stock price, I mean, I think it comes back to momentum. <laughs> it comes back to the, the investors are just looking for the next big thing, right? Yeah, I mean, I've had this nice idea for about a year now because the energy transition is is such a perfect uh, test case for it. Um, but for investors, it's, it's incredibly reasonable to kind of buy both. Like I wouldn't use 
Lucid as, and Rivian as examples, nor Tesla, because the, the extremity of their market capitalization sort of renders them, at least in my mind, somewhat uninvestable and people shouldn't take this as investment advice, obviously. But the, the pair trade that I come up with is that like the old and the new in terms of the energy transition works pretty decently because your your Volkswagens and your, your traditional automakers are classic value stocks. They have current revenues uh, and earnings. Um, they're cheaply valued. They have dividends. They're well-managed, well-run. They have existing partnerships, trade networks, sales networks. They understand the car industry and they have incredible expertise, um, but they might struggle for growth. So it's just a classic value stock, really. Um, on the other hand, if you could find maybe much smaller um, you know, companies in the electric vehicle value chain, whether that's involved in battery making, cathode powders, smaller electric vehicle makers doing like fire trucks or buses or school buses, you know, niche applications where you can create a sort of dominant advantage and it's not worth $100 billion, it's worth less than <laughs> one. Um, that's then a classic growth stock, right? Because they have no sales yet and you get the benefits of share price appreciation from one with growth prospects and high multiples. Um, and it just provides us quite a nice balance. It's a value and a growth. You're getting dividends, uh, low price to earnings ratios, current revenues and earnings this year. And then you're also on the other half getting growth and speculation and excitement and narrative. Um, and I just think it's important for people not to put both their feet in one camp. And, you know, that's just classic diversification, right? They can both do well over different time periods and they probably balance each other, balance each other out roughly along the way. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a sensible approach. I, I and I, I saw an interesting um, comment uh, about it was just a, it was a bit of a joke, and, it's, and it, someone had posted that uh, uh, the price of uh, Rivian stock down uh, in early trading because people have realised that a hot dog stand has greater earnings. Um, so you know that that probably explains a lot about what's going on in that space. Well, it, it reveals nice things about the nature of investment. I think like people like to pretend that. Uh, you know, there's only one way to invest. Or, do you know what I mean? Like, it's important to remember that you can invest for dividends or you can invest for share price appreciation. And that's a reasonable thing to do. And there's earnings, but there's also narrative. And it's not like value is the only thing that matters. Like, I I, am attracted to the traditional value approach of finding undervalued companies that are actually much better than people think. And that's very nice. But at the same time, what we're doing investing is trying to think think what other people think about this company and what they're going to think in the future. So if you can incorporate that into a, a non-value based analysis and realize five, 10 years ago that everyone's going to go crazy for electric cars, therefore Tesla or whoever, um, that's reasonable too. And you don't have like your hot dog point is true, but it just shows that there is more to investing than earnings. Yeah. I think, you know what, you're, you're spot on, right? So I think what I, uh... And this has sort of been a few years in the making, whereas the, it's a very fundamental change in how we look at companies and how we assess and value companies. And and we know that the narrative behind a company never really is appreciated. I don't think it historically has been appreciated as much as it is starting to now in terms of how much value it can actually add to a stock price or to, or to a company. That's an intangible uh, metric for, for analyzing the value of a company. What's the narrative behind this and how much is that worth to, worth to the company? And there is absolutely no doubt that that's a huge driver for a lot of the value behind companies, Tesla, Rivian, Lucid. There are, there, are, there are a bunch of other things, obviously, that you can use to assess and value a company, but that underlying narrative of what it is they do and that theme that they are a part of and how important that is to the market, and when we talk about the market, like there's the market is a lot of you know there's market makers and there's you know ETFs that with and there's mandated funds and there's a whole complex arrangement. But there's also a lot of people that just want to buy stocks based on a theme and a narrative, and they don't really care about the value. Like I think there are a lot of people that want to buy these kinds of stocks because they think that one day they're going to buy a Tesla or a Rivian or a or a lucid air or, or something like that. And so that they go, all right, well, I'm getting ahead of this. Um, even though they make no money, even though they run at massive losses, I don't care because I'm trying to take a long-term approach, but on a very short-term narrative um, and kind of yeah, a bit of a hype cycle. So how we look at stocks and how, how people look at stocks um, has fundamentally changed over the years. I find that, I, I just find it really interesting because you're right, you know, back, 
you know, a decade, 20 years ago, it was like, you know, where are the undervalued companies? You know, where can we undig something where, you know, the, you know, it's, it's book price is, is, is so small compared to the stock uh, value or, you know, what are the, what are the net assets underneath, you know, or maybe the net asset value of the stock is higher than the actual stock price. It's like, there's this discrepancy and, you know, you can find these more traditional metrics, but now it's like, what's the story? Tell me the story. And, and, and that's really powerful p- part of the puzzle. There's a nice thing where, you know, traditional finance investing types have always sort of scoffed at the retail investor, the ordinary investor and sort of said, ah, you know, but the problem with them is they're far too short term. They need to think much longer term. And so retail investors started investing in things like Tesla and all these incredibly long term. They really stretch their time horizon out for their investments. It doesn't even make, you know, half of them don't make any money yet. And suddenly all the traditional finance types go, ah, well, it's, it's ludicrous. They're thinking way too long term, you know you need earnings now and I just like there's a sort of mismatch there but I think it's important to remember with the narrative stuff that that's not a constant it's not like a constant value input that we should always think about when we're investing the important thing is to recognize how important it is now so a couple of years ago even Robert Schiller famed economist of the the Schiller price to earnings curve which uses 10-year average earnings and provides a sort of smoother picture he his latest book was narrative economics and it was how narratives work and it's actually how a narrative works almost like a pandemic spreading through the population creating this um this bubble that we're now seeing in in narrative hype related stocks and that will change if if markets tank 20 or 40 or 60 percent the only thing people will care about is safety risk mitigation current earnings value suddenly the things that people care about change and so what i think is is interesting is that you can't just have one style. I mean, you can, if you're really good at investing and you're a value investor, you can have found ways to make money and keep up with the market in this, you know, ridiculous, this incredible growth bull market. But really for most people, it is about being aware of the changes in investor psychology in the broader market, realizing that now narrative is very important. So you have to factor it in. But if things go wrong, that will change. Narrative will be a complete non-consideration with markets down 50% and other things will matter. And so just not, not, I guess, being wedded to one factor, one one sort of analysis and remembering that, you know, in two years time, you shouldn't be like, oh, well, narrative was a really big deal in 2021. So maybe it will be again. You have to always just move with the times. And yeah, it's worth remembering, I think. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly a part. And, and I think with that, you know, and, and we see stocks that move very quickly now. Um, you know, the kinds of returns that I thought you typically only ever saw in the crypto market, but you used to get them in the stock market now, you know, 20, 30% shifts in a day, pretty commonplace at the moment, which to be, which is bonkers, really. I mean, you know, you, uh, in my experience and, and people that have been in the markets long enough, you just like 30% in a year would have been a wicked outcome. Like you take that every day of the week. Now it's like, oh, if I haven't, if my stock hasn't done a hundred percent this year, I feel like I kind of failed. It's like we, we our, our expectation shift has been dramatic with how how some of these prices uh, can move. Yeah, so, let me tell you, the value investing podcasts are having a very different conversation, Sam. Yeah, no, I look through look I look through some of the p- portfolio um, that, that we've got uh, with South Bank Research in Frontier Tech Investor or Revolutionary Trend Investor or Crypto Profits Extreme, and it's like with the crypto stuff, if like if it hasn't ten x, I'm like, well. It's like, you know, if we if we find like a five, six hundred percent winner, it's just like, no, nah, I feel like I've underperformed. Or even like, you know, some of the big stocks that we've got currently in the revolutionary trend portfolio, it's like, it's not a hundred percent. It's just we haven't really done well in the last year if it hasn't hit hundred percent. I'm like, hang on, hang on a second, just just remember how good a hundred percent return is on a stock. And then so you've got to temper, you know, some of these big narrative moves, uh some of these big narratives and how they move stocks and remember that you know, it's it's okay to take profits as well along the way. So it's always something we've got to make sure we focus on for our subscribers is to be smart with, uh, you know, you can get onto a good stock, can be, you know, great long-term value stock, it could be a really great growth story with a great narrative behind it and you can find some quick, fast returns and then, you know, it could do 100, 200%. You're like, yes, we're going to 10X. But it's like, actually, let's just remember that the narrative can flip on a dime and within a matter of days, you can see some of that return. So it's important to to remember that markets uh, move down as well as up. 
um, funnily enough, and to take profits where sometimes you just shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth. But anyway, we've gone on very long uh, today. Um, it's been a while, as I said, since we sort of caught up. We haven't even covered crypto. Bitcoin hit all-time highs while- Taproot came through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chat. Now, I, next week, I want to hear about it. We're going to, we'll have to dive into that. Um, as we head towards Christmas as well, we'll continue with the podcast. We'll have a special end of year. We'll do a Christmas one. Kit has promised me that he's no, going to buy I a haven't. Christmas I jumper. Not, I will not be doing it. I'm sorry. He has promised me he will buy a Christmas <laughs> jumper. So you can expect a Christmas edition uh, Exponential Investor podcast as we head towards Dying that time of the year. Chance. Both of us in Christmas jumpers. It's been promised. Um, but thanks for tuning in this week. And we'll be back again with you very soon next week. Um, thanks for tuning in. Bye for now.